Hello, and welcome to Just Another Real Estate Podcast, where we'll speak with Arizona's most successful real estate professionals to better understand their business, current market conditions, team and business building strategies, successes, and challenges. This podcast is brought to you by Dwell Inspect Arizona with your host, Sean Garvey. Well, welcome back to Just Another Real Estate Podcast, discussion with the home inspector. Um, today, our guest is Rick DeLuca with DeLuca Real Estate Group at FSR Realty. Did I get that right? I was nervous right. about that one. Uh, Rick, you are the first guest of the 2023 year, and also we're going to call it season two. So um, thank you for being here, um, and thank you for being on the show today. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Rick, you're a uh, your real estate agent that, that we've had the, the pleasure and opportunity to work with you for the last several years, almost since the beginning of, of the inspection company when we started it. Um, and so it's, it's an honor to have you on. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun during this hour. Uh, you have a diverse path through real estate, um, and we look forward to exploring it. Rick, um, sure. tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm an Arizona native. So I grew up in Yuma, Arizona, and uh, uh, lived there most of my life, and then went to school for a couple of years in Flagstaff at uh, NEU, Northern Arizona sure. University, and I got a uh, marketing and advertising degree there, business. So then a um, little stint back in Yuma for a bit, then came to Phoenix in about, see, about 2000. I've been here ever since. Awesome. Um, so you've been from the west side of the state to the north side of the state and then centered into the, the middle of the state. Um, what brought you down from, you know, the small town of Flagstaff and, and settled down into Phoenix? Did you just feel the need for more action or to be surrounded more city? Did you did you follow the love of your life? Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, you know, just growing up in smaller towns, you you kind of want to go, you know, to a bigger town and and uh, obviously Phoenix is a lot much bigger city. So moved over here, you know, Flagstaff's great, but uh, there's not, you know, I went there for school and there's not a lot more, much going on there. So came back to Phoenix to, sure. I took a marketing uh, position down here. Okay. Which marketing position did you take? It was actually for um, an insurance company and we developed okay. marketing for, you know, their life, health and uh, insurance and their uh, dentistry, things like that. Oh yeah. I had a, a similar path when, when I was right out of college too. I, I graduated ASU with a marketing degree. Um, and one of my internships was, um, selling insurance and that was a, oh, okay. that was a tough gig. <laughs> I wasn't quite ready for that in my, <laughs> in my level of maturity then. Um, and so now you, you've, uh, evolved into a su successful real estate career. Um, you've been doing this for a long time, but you haven't always started there. Tell me, um, what, how you, how did you venture into the world of real estate? Yeah, actually. So what happened was, so I came up for that marketing job and then I, I've always been into investing with uh, stocks since a young age. And so, um, I actually did pretty good, you know, uh, going through college investing cause that was the dot com era. Oh, yeah. So, so I did, you know, Microsoft, Yahoo, Broadcom, all that stuff. And so what I did was, um, Shortly after I, I had that job, marketing job, I moved over to Merrill Lynch. I became a, a financial advisor. I was looking to get into that. That So that's my experience with that is kind of like your insurance experience. That is very tough. So um, that wasn't uh, that wasn't the best experience, I guess, because, you know, it's just tough getting to invest people, especially when you're so young. Sure. And so a friend of mine, actually from college, a good friend of mine, he, he was like, hey, you know, I'm doing this appraisal company. Um, you want to talk about it. So we had lunch and we actually, you know, we went in lunch, uh, by where I worked and he took me on an appraisal and he was like, yeah, you want to do this? And I was like, sounds good. And so <laughs> I literally, uh, quit and just did this. And, you know, it's, it's an all commission job, no, no base pay or anything. And it was just, Hey, you got to go out there and get your own business. So that's how I got into it. And then I did that for 12 years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and uh, and the for those that don't know, the venture into becoming an a, a appraiser is is no easy feat. I would imagine that you had to. Um, I don't know what it was 
a while back, but I know now it's, it's hundreds or thousands of hours of, of apprenticeship and yeah, um, several years to get your license. So on a, on a whim, you're like, yeah, let's do it. And now you have to hit the books. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of my uh, entrepreneurial background. Uh, my yeah. family owned a, a, a waterbed store back in the seventies. Yeah. And then it later developed, you know, into a regular store. Um, and so I always kind of worked in a small business and, and, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to get out of here and get into corporate America. But then I was like, you know what? Corporate America is not for me. So something like this was a great opportunity. So I went with it and it worked well. Uh, I worked with them for several years, you know, did my apprenticeship, got my license, um, continued on. And then I started my own appraisal company and got a couple more appraisers with us. And we, you know, it was a good company for several years. Um, and then what happened was, you know, as you went on, uh, we went, went into the uh, you know, the great recession sure. in 2009, 2010, and while all the mortgage companies are drying up, which was fine. Uh, you know, everything was, was okay, except, you know, they needed, um, kind of a scapegoat, I think <laughs> with that whole thing. So that, you know, they came back with some, um, you know, legislature was passed, not so much on real estate, uh, agents or realtors, uh, a little bit on mortgage, but the people I don't think who have the best lobbyists at the time were appraisers. So we, <laughs> they came back, they came back with, uh, I think it's not in effect anymore. It was like the home valuation code of conduct. And it right. was like a bill and was totally changed the appraisal world. So it, it made it so we couldn't go out and get our own business. We had to work with a third party intermediary. And, and that just, that's why I transitioned out of that because one of the, one of the main one reasons is I just didn't like, you know, having, a business relationship with like just an office going through forms, getting email, you know, mails, you know, I was, I was more of a face-to-face -face kind of person. So didn't feel the same. So yeah. when you were, when you were um, looking for new business as an appraiser, what did that mean? You were speaking with banks or you were recruiting real estate agents or both or title. Yeah, companies? I, I would go to banks, um, you know, maybe attorneys to have for divorces or, someone passes, they need uh, an appraisal for the estate. Um, I also worked with uh, several banks directly, mortgage brokers. So you would just make relationships. In fact, I had some really good ones with some of the larger Midwestern banks here. Mm -hmm. And I became like one of their review appraisers too, because they did a lot of high-end luxury homes. And that process is a little different for appraisal. So they'd they'd have like maybe one appraiser go, then a secondary, and then they'd send both appraisals to me and I would review both and then put a final value. Interesting. Interesting. So, so, so 2008, 9, 10 hit, um, the appraisers are getting beat up by the government, uh, <laughs> scapegoats. Um, and so what, what is your transition out there? You see, you see that the world's changing and you, you know how to pivot or you, you look to pivot from there. Yeah. So I started looking at different options. I did look at, I, I had a little insurance company for a bit, you know, too, like you had. Um, yeah. And then uh, I started doing a little bit more appraisals. Well, because a lot of bankruptcies were going on. So I do them for the banks for like maybe a restaurant or, you know, a clothing store and, and before they took it to auction. So interesting. I kind of did, you know, because really you can do uh, different appraisals, uh, you know, in Arizona. So I did that. And, and as I was doing it, my family was retiring, closing, my parents were closing up their business and my brother worked there and he was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, you know, I need something. I said, Hey, you know, I'm working with all these investors because, you know, the bank, I was taking these construction places and um, pre-construction. It was just land and a blueprint and I'd have to appraise the property. Oh, wow. And then, and then as they built it, I'd have to go out there and until it was finished and then given a final appraisal as of that date. So, so it was kind of like what house flippers do now, you mm -hmm. know, with, they take a property and, and I start seeing, I says, wow, this house sold. I'd go in, you know, cause we're in appraisals. We're going into hundreds of homes, you know, every right. month. Um, so so I'd go into a house and I'd say, look at this house. Like it should have sold for more if they just had better carpeting or flooring and paint. And, you know, that was kind of the idea. And so I was telling my brother about this. And so what they did was they, they started doing this in Yuma and he would buy properties and then do some little renovations and resell them. And he's like, Oh, this is great. So he was doing that, doing that. And then 
and I was looking at him, helping him. And then I kept seeing like his listings, you know, they're okay. But, you know, being in marketing and advertising kind of background, I was like, you know, you should do this. This would be better. So he started doing it and, and it, um, increasing the sales prices. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so, and then he got to a point where he's like, look, why don't you, and, and I was doing, helping some other, uh, doing some consulting for other investors too. And so they all told me the same thing, like, go get your real estate license and help us because we're paying our realtor more, all this money. And you're giving us all the great advice. All we're doing is passing it along. Tell, and sometimes they don't even want to do what we say, what you're telling us. And so I said, okay, so I finally got my real estate license and then started working. It was pretty much just investors, just people like go in, Hey, this is, you should buy this place. Um, and if, you know, and they say, this is what it would cost to do this. And I said, okay, based on that, we should probably be able to sell it for this. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. So you, you kind of pivoted with the experience that you had. It wasn't just a direct, like, um, I'm going to shut off the appraiser brain and then turn into the, to a real estate agent, but you, it was more of a need, um, that the team that you were working with found you and, and they said, we can utilize the values and the, the tools that, that you've created through that experience. Um, and that's yeah. an interesting <laughs> segue. And one, I quite honestly didn't expect because like, appraisers, home inspectors um, come in after the deal has been formulated and we're kind of behind the scenes, right? Um, that we work in conjunction with other teammates and then you step into, I thought you were maybe moving towards the spotlight, but it, it really kind of, you kind of backdoored into that that position or the, the need to get your real estate license. Yeah. Bringing value. Yeah. And that's kind of what our whole business concept is based on is that, that, um, knowledge of knowing the market instead of just you know kind of coming in and looking at it salesy we look at everything you know because we do have like a business background yeah we look at it as more of a business yeah you happen to be a realtor that that sells a real estate business that sells real estate um just similar as home inspection companies are um businesses that perform home inspections um, right and that's that's an important distinction for a lot of people to make that don't necessarily make because the the um, the job of real estate agent, the job of a home inspector becomes their persona um, and becomes their life, and they really should separate it because it is two different things. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. One thing you said to me as we were chatting in that business you've created, which I find to be unique um, or relatively unique, is is that your group the DeLuca real estate group has a mission statement. Um, and I don't think it should be unique because it, it, you probably put some time and energy and thought into it, but it, it's a, it's a guiding light that gives you direction um, as you're digging through and, and building your business. What is your mission statement? Our, our mission statement is uh, to help people build wealth through real estate. Okay. Where did you get inspired to actually create a mission state statement? Well, we do, we, you know, we have a business coach ourselves and uh -huh. so they help guide us. And, and so kind of just discussing with them, they're always telling us our unique identifier is our background in that appraisal world. So they're like, Hey, embrace that. And then, so we started thinking about it in our business because of course we we're talking a lot about investing, but uh, you know, as, as we're working with investors, our business just kept growing because they're like, Hey, you know, um, you, you went and, uh, you know, you did a good job selling my, my houses or rentals or whatever, They're like, can you help my niece help my daughter? And, you know, they need to buy a home for the first time. And so people were, were coming to us and saying, you know, you guys are, are great agents. And we're like, Hey, thank you. And then, and then will you, it was funny because people were asking, is it okay if I refer my, you know, daughter to you, my cousin? And it was like, Yeah. You know, because they they look at us uh, differently in the real estate world as like business people versus you know, kind of you know where realtors are kind of perceived as salesy and and gimmicky a lot of times, unfortunately. So so of course we do that, and and so as we kind of were working with it, you know, say you have a first time home buyer, um, a young couple, and maybe they're just looking to get into a property or tired of paying rent. And they're like, of course, they're drawn to like a condo or townhouse because it's a lower price. Mm -hmm. But but when we're sitting there, what we do is whenever we have a client, we do a consultation before we we get even start showing houses. And 
And a lot of times we explain to them or when we're in the process of seeing houses, you know, people are like looking at it, especially a first time home buyer. And they're like, almost like looking for their dream home a lot of times. Right. But we tell, you know, I, we just tell people, look, uh, let's be honest, you know, this isn't your dream home. You know, you're, you're probably going to move in about three to five years. Right. And, and they look at us like, wait, we haven't even ever bought a house. And you're already talking about us moving. And it was like, yes, because we want to set the foundation to, you know, we, we talk with people like, okay, you have a young couple and like, well, you guys can maybe going to have kids or yeah, probably in a couple of years, this and that. And okay, well then are you going to live here? Well, no, we're not going to live here with kids we Want a yard and things like that. And we need some more bedrooms. This is only two bedrooms. Okay. Well then you're going to get a house. And so we want to lay the foundation because we tell them, look, we're going to help you buy this. And then in two, three, four years, you're going to call us and we're going to need to sell this. And we, we want to try to be smart about this purchase because hopefully you built equity during that time. And then you can use that equity to buy a more expensive home that you need for your family at that time. Huh. I think that's an incredible approach, uh, thinking through the first purchase um, and something I haven't heard before. And I was, as I was listening to, I was kind of smiling, thinking that uh, I'm hearing your financial planning in there. I'm hearing your appraisal and then I'm hearing your you act as kind of a, um, a mentor or a guide guidance through that purchase. Um, and I think it's really important to then think about buying houses other than just this is where I want to live for the next yeah. two or three years. Well, um, a lot of the like financial gurus you'll hear and sure. they'll, they'll say how, you know, your house isn't an asset, you're, you know, different things, it's liability because you're paying, but I mean, you got to pay to live somewhere, you know, either right. paying rent or you're paying a mortgage and it's so much better to pay your own mortgage because you get all those benefits of it. But, but two, um, it, for some people, they may never invest in the stock market. They may never invest in like cryptocurrency or some, whatever it is out sure. there. But, but they, uh, you know, as we deal with people, you know, as they get older, um, we see people who are like downsizing now or retiring, or moving somewhere else, or moving in with kids. And that may be, their home may be their only asset, financial, uh, you know, substance that they have in their entire life. Sure. So that's why we try to get people that mindset. Um, and, you know, we've taught people like, hey, buy a house, move. Uh, if you, you know, depending on the conditions, move at, you got to uh, kind of look at the, the temperature of the real estate market, obviously. But if you keep kind of taking that money, that equity in there and move it up and move it up, then it does give you that ability to sell at the end, pay cash for a, a smaller place, go back to that original condo you bought yeah. 30 years ago, have it paid off and then have a chunk of money, you know? And a lot of times, you know, as of right now, the tax code is as a couple, you can take $500,000 tax free. Like where else can you, can you do that? Wow. Yeah. I don't know. Not, not a lot of places. That's good no. advice. Um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, I just want to reiterate, I think that's important to think about the whole timeline of houses that you may live in. Cause a lot of times it's just the, I'm sick of paying rent. Um, yeah. I want to start investing in myself, but what does that really mean? Um, you know, and, and what does that mean from three to five to 15 years now? Um, and, and that's a good perspective on that. I appreciate you sharing it. Yeah. Um, some people it's a new concept, but a lot of people, you know, because of podcasts and, and all this, uh, you know, the real estate investor, um, culture now, a lot of people are like coming to us now and saying, Hey, I, I'm interested in house hacking or doing this or doing that. So it's kind of great because we're already like on the same page and, and it's just, and it energizes us to see like, you know, younger people like coming in and wanting to do this because they see it. And it's instead of like, you know, having to go and explain to people like how to look at your house a little differently. So it's, it's exciting for us. It, it is exciting. And I think one great thing that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of the jury's still out on, you know, social media and the, um, the assimilation of information that we're getting as, as humans is way faster than it's ever been. And, you know, 10 years ago, um, yeah. You know, the Yahoo era that you mentioned a while back, um, you know, like we're taking on so much, but some of the positives is I think 
as a human race as we're adapting to that is is that we're becoming smarter and and more educated and the ability to you know if you use these tools you could research things for your benefit um and you mentioned house hacking which i have no clue what that is and i'm excited to ask you about it but um that's the ability of of listening to people who have conversations and experience um to better your life tell me what house hacking is <laughs> uh so, so house hacking <laughs> It's, it can take a few different forms, but in general, it's, it's where you kind of like, say you have a, you're renting an apartment and maybe you have a roommate or two, or you're renting a house. Well, house hacking is maybe, maybe one of those people takes the initiative and goes and qualifies to purchase a house. And of course they don't have a lot of money down a lot of times. So they're, they're trying to get like an FHA loan or something, you know, with low down payment. Um, and then they use uh, maybe it's maybe it's a duplex even, and they live in one, but then the rent from the other one helps them qualify for their down payment, and and then uh, not only qualify but even actually make their payment. So sometimes people will go like you know because you remember you know you hear like uh, in college and stuff people like oh I get a four bedroom house and a bunch of uh, yeah. guys living there together. Well, it's the same concept, but except one of them goes and buys a place, rents the other three rooms. And literally gets his mortgage paid and maybe even cash flows a little bit of money all while building equity in his property. Makes sense. And I think it's it's the point I was making is that people you're you're starting to see the benefits of all that information and and you're getting a savvier buyer um, and people who are looking to buy with purpose. Yeah. Um, one thing you mentioned is that people asked you if you had for permission to refer you. I mean, your job is is to uh, acquire people who are interested in purchasing real estate generally in period. But what do you mean by that? Because it, it sounds like it, that sounded like more of a personal purchase, but are, are you talking that um, investors you had worked with are, are looking to steer their people in the direction because of the service that you provide? Is that yeah, it, it was kind of a it was kind of funny because you know as a as an agent usually you kind of start there and you're like hey we gotta go out to everybody and try to get referrals from people, right, but right. we had built this little culture of individuals where they almost were you know they looked at us differently like as not as real estate agents but as business people like business partners for them, and and they almost were kind of like not wanting to share us that much you know in kind of a way it was kind of funny. Uh, but I was like, yeah, you know, it's, you know, we're, we're typically, you, you know, as you're begging for referrals, but here people are like asking us, like, is it okay if I give you a referral? <laughs> and so I was like, Hey, you know, we, we did something accidentally here, but we, you know, we recognized it. So we try to, to capitalize it on it in our business. Got it. So it was, it was just another, um, complimentary pivot or it was a complimentary to the service that you were providing. They saw the value that, that Rick and his team could provide. And they thought it'd be good for their family members or a personal transaction as opposed to just a strict yeah. investor. And that's what, in the end, what led to our, our mission statement is um, helping people build wealth through real estate. So no matter if you're an investor or you're just going to buy a house and live in it for 30 years or 40 years, or maybe buy two or three homes, you should still look at it as, as a financial decision in your life. For sure. It's funny, we can we can relate as as inspectors too that um, you know, especially when you're first starting and they'd be like, Hey, do you do you drive all the way out to Goodyear? And be like, Yeah, I drive all the way out to Goodyear. Uh, or would you inspect a, a mobile home? Be like, Yeah, I our, my job is to inspect a house. You just you sell it. I'll go anywhere you need to inspect it and we'll, we'll make it happen. You don't have to ask me that, but I appreciate yeah. you asking me that. <laughs> Um, and it's funny that you mentioned too, that, that people wanted to keep you a, a secret there too. Um, when on the inside, you're probably like, Hey, give my name out to everybody. Exactly. <laughs> um, who would an ideal client be for you? Um, you know, do you have an ideal client or, um, you know, what does that look like? Yeah. So we tend to break them out into three segments, uh, and we do a consultation at the beginning. So you either, you know, if you're a buyer, we do a buyer consultation, a uh, seller has a place to sell. We do seller consultation. And then if you're an investor, whether you're looking to do flips or wholesaling or, you know, whatever your dynamic is, uh, buy and hold rentals, short-term rentals, midterm rentals, we do that investor consultation. So we go through and we see 
how we can help one another. Cause we has to be a relationship that it goes both ways. Like right. we don't want to be, you know, um, just like a salesperson or, you know, one time we, you know, we, we look at every client as we want to try to build and work with this person. Always. We want to be your agent. Yeah. And so we always want to make sure it's a good fit. And, and we've frankly had to tell some people, um, you know what, I don't think we're a good fit for each other because we're really? just not on the same mindset. Interesting. But, you know, it's, it's not like we're super picky, but, you know, we have to, you know, we want to enjoy everything and make sure it's a good, you know, like some investors and they just don't have um, maybe the same mindset or, or, you know, in, in our ethics too, we try to be, uh, stay on a certain line and we want to make sure we, we could keep that consistent in our business. I know. I mean, I, I think that that's great that you recognize that a lot of people won't, and they'd go through the pain of, of learning a hard lesson because they strayed away from, from, um, what they knew to be right in, yeah. in the chase of, shall we say a dollar? Um, and I think that's probably because that you have a mission state statement, which if they're straying from that mission statement, or if you have a vision vision as well, um, or it sounds like you have values incorporated in, in what you're, what you guys are working with yeah. as well. And if you, if you stray, if you go back to that type of stuff, whenever you're having a hard time, it can help you to guide it. And you could say, Hey, um, respectfully, this isn't for us. Yeah. And, and a lot of that was came from the appraisal world. Cause we, we, you know, I was working in appraisals 2004, seven, eight, nine, and there was a lot of wild West lending going on. Right. Uh -huh. And there was a lot of unethical lenders fraud going on. And if we detected it or, you know, saw something even kind of iffy, we, we just let them know we're no longer working together. Oh, wow. Because, you know, we're all licensed, you know, we have a standard to go by and, sure. and we, we want to, you know, we're not in it to just to, to do one job, like, right. You're not in it to do one inspection. You're in to, no. to yeah. keep your license and this is your business. So if you don't have your license, you know, so we, we may, Make sure we try to make sure we keep everything, uh, you know, with the best partners we can find. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you don't want anybody asking you an unethical thing for, you know, one piece of business that could affect the rest of your business and, and yeah, appraisers, yeah, like insure, uh, inspectors, uh, real estate agents, it's a volume game. And if you, if you right. make that mistake on one, it can cost you on the other 1500 that you were going to do that year, whatever. Yeah. Like I was offered, you know, oh, we'll, we'll pay you a few hundred extra dollars just to, you know, maybe because like uh, there was a guideline for FHA that if they're security bars, they have to have a quick release uh -huh. yeah. and they don't always have that. They're just bolted in. And, and so they would tell me, you know, say, offer me a few hundred dollars to say it was a quick release when it wasn't. And I was like, no, 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 we're not, we're not doing things like that. Wow. It's not worth it. Those were the wild days, huh? <laughs> yeah. Glad those days are over. <laughs> wasn't there a... Wasn't there a point as an appraiser, you, you guys didn't even, maybe there's a rumor and not you specifically, but you didn't even have to go inside a house. There were just so much happening at the time you did a drive-by appraisal. Well, that is a, there, that is a, a type of appraisal. There is are drive-by appraisals. That's interesting. <laughs> so it's all dictated, like the lenders giving money. So their threshold, wherever they're comfortable. So if they're like, Hey, if we're cool with you driving by, then I've done that. I did that before. I just would drive by, take a picture and that's it. I was like, we're just, I, you know, you just put, we're assuming a lot of things here. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'd imagine that. I mean, I've been at inspections before and I'd see like somebody driving by and taking pictures and I'd be like, Oh, that's gotta be the appraiser. Gosh, their job's so easy. <laughs> but now not, all, not always with, it was, yeah, you have some fun places to go to. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, You've mentioned that you have a coach or uh, a coaching system that you've been working with. Um, how did you happen upon that? Because I, I like to dig into that a little bit because I think um, for people that are out in the the um, entrepreneurial world, it's important to have some guidance and and um, external reflection on on where your business is um, so that you can continue to propel it. Um, I think a coach is a good way um, or probably the best way to do it. And so tell me about that relationship and and how you came across it. Yeah. So I, I've always been kind of interested in the business world and, you know, read these different business books. And now it's great. Like you said, all these podcasts and yeah. YouTube, I, I can listen to them while I'm driving. 
but I noticed that there was a theme with all these successful individuals is that they, a lot of them had mentors. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, we need a mentor. And so I, I searched out and I looked at all these different programs. I was like, I got to get a mentor. And, and I'm kind of like, um, I, I kind of overthink maybe things that sometimes, but my brother is just like, he takes action. So, you know, we work together. He's in, in Yuma and I'm up in, in the Phoenix area. Yeah. And, and, uh, I was like, you know, let's go to this event. You know, I was talking, you know, I was trying to get him, I guess that when I look back, I was like wanted validation. So I had been looking at this program, different programs, but the Tom Ferry program over and over again. So then I had him come up and we went to an event and he's like, let's sign up right now. You know, so <laughs> we literally signed up at the event and that's how we got into it. And we've been in it for like several years now oh, wow. and it's, it's been great. Yeah. But you, I think you need somebody, um, you know, we're, we're self-driven. We, you know, we pretty much go, we don't need as much accountability, but it is nice to have some accountability and also, um, just like a, you know, somebody chiming in on your business a little bit to help you give you that little extra push. So that's what I recommend, especially like new agents. I always tell them, you know, in fact, um, I had somebody message me through meetup this week and it was an agent who's like, Hey, I'm looking to get into real estate. What advice would you give me? And I, and he said he was in the tech world and he wants to get out of tech. So, you know, like you said, like, how do people get into it? He's like, okay, you know, he's in tech yeah, and just wants to become a real estate agent. And and, you know, it's, I've, I've seen this a few times. It's kind of funny because it's, you know, you see like a lot of analytical people and they moved into this career. That's more, you know, on the, uh, you know, you got to be more social person. Right. On the For sure. And, you know, not always, but, but you tend to see that more. And so I just told him, I says, look, you know, my advice to you is you can go get your license and become an agent like really easily. But I says, approach it like how you became a tech person. You probably had to go to school. You probably had to pay money. You probably had to take time for training. Do the same thing with your real estate career. Get a mentor. Work with somebody. And, and you know, you might have to pay for that coaching or whatnot. But but you got to look at it long term. And that's going to get you there. Otherwise, you know, real estate is like almost a 90% failure rate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always tell people it's it's you know, everybody looks at it. Oh, look at this person. They, they make so much money or whatever in real estate, but there's a whole lot more people that aren't making any money in real sure. estate. So, yeah. And that's why I would say mentors help you help you along your way. Yeah. It's interesting that you brought it up. I, I did write that down. Um, I think the, you know, the traditional vision of a mentor relationship is, is an older person or a person of experience guiding somebody who's newer into the business. Um, and I think with the use of technology, that's changed a little bit. Like you can have a mentorship relationship on a coach where you're paying a monthly fee. Um, you can have a mentor relationship on podcasts. I mean, you mm -hmm. listen to people on podcasts and you can learn anything under the sun. Um, and then there's, uh, and so it, you don't have to explore that mentorship relationship where you're just looking for that person to give you time because a lot of times if they're successful, they're not going to, yeah. um, or they might not. Um, or, or like the price is out of your reach or the so. price is out of your reach. Yeah. Yeah. Even in those situations too, um, you know, where you're, where you're paying that I was thinking even just in the situation where, you know, somebody who's run a business for a long time is giving back to somebody who's starting, um, even if it's free, but that's yeah. probably shrinking at these, these points too. So great exploration into the, um, the coaching program. And, and it looks like it's, it's really beneficial into the structure of your business. Yeah, it's been very, very, very uh, beneficial for our group. Um, tell me what you're doing with Meetup, because that's not something I've heard in a long time. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm interested. So we, um, I have two different um, Meetups to kind of started here. Um, one is, I just wanted to get involved. I, we, we already are involved with um with different investors and we, you know, like the Azria here, the real estate investor association, we're highly involved in that. I was just there last night, actually, they're a great organization, but it seems like, um, you know, a lot of times people come to learn and then if they, they either dwindle off or if they get success, they leave. And I just wanted to be around more, you know, successful, um, investors. Cause a lot of times they kind of get going, they get their little routine and they, they just kind of go off in their own little group. Okay. So I formed like a meetup with 
experienced investors. We meet once a month together and it's a small group, but just really great individuals just show up. Um, and then some are starting to come back regularly, which is great. So we're kind of building that community, but you know, sometimes you see people like, yeah, you know, I just barely, I got a couple rentals this year, my first ones. And then you have other people that are like, I, I own, you know, 20, 30 rentals. And, and then we have people that are doing land deals. We have people that are doing short-term, mid-term. So it's, it's like kind of like a, almost a little mini mastermind now that we started. Wow. And for those of, of you don't, that don't know, meetup is a website. Um, I think it's meetup.com. Right. And I, I've been on there. Yeah. Um, when I first started business and I was, I was looking to meet as many people as I went, I went on there and I went to just meet up, um, meetups, their appointments out in the community and you'd go out and meet people. Um, and I think yeah. they have them for like hiking and any, uh, running yeah. clubs and any type of thing, board but games, whatever you want, just really <laughs> whatever interest people have, you can just go on there and just meet up with a group of like-minded individuals and talk. That's great. You thought outside the box to use, you know, what, what would be considered a, maybe even an older social media, um, that, that can one day benefit your business or hopefully is currently benefiting your business. You said you had two of them. What was the other one? The other one, we just kind of started, um, another vendor, uh, a title company was came to me and they were like, Hey, you know, um, let's do some, some, uh, different events together. And, and I do some training for agents, like on how to value properties, how to price them, how to do you oh, know, wow. comparables. So, so um, I was like, you know, it'd be fun to do a goal setting one. So we actually are doing a goal setting one um, next week. And so I just put it on meetup. I said, you know what? I have my meetup account. I'm going to throw it on meetup and, and all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. I, I get all these agents and then we're interacting. And I was like, this is great. You know, and yeah. I found another a uh, group of like-minded agents. And so um, I was like, let's, let's start doing this. And, and um, I just kind of put like top real estate agents in Phoenix and trying to, to find some agents who want to better their business. That's exciting. Congratulations on that. Yeah. Thanks. Do um, I think the, the fact that you were appraisal for such a long time, do people, when they start to get into business with you, is that something that they often know, or does it kind of become a, a value add as, and I, I assume that it assume it, it changes on a client per client basis, but um, you know, when you're out showing people homes and, and you have the ability to tell them real world values of it, um, do they often know that, that their real estate agent was an appraiser? Yeah. I try to explain that uh, in our first consult, that first meeting. That's why we Got try it. to make it a for formal meeting, even if it's on zoom or, or in person, because I want to highlight these points, because what I found is, you know, say you have a buyer and they're like, Hey, I found this house. I want to go see. And you jump in the car and you just, so your purpose is just to see a house. And, and really our purpose for our first meeting should be, you know, I tell everybody is to put together a game plan uh, to see how we're going to work together and work towards that goal versus just going to see a house. So when I do that, it's one of the points I try well, I, you know, should always highlight yeah. is that I was an appraiser because I think it adds a lot of value, whether you're a buyer, yeah. a seller, you know, because sellers are always, you know, they want the most. And I said, hey, look, I'm just trying to, you know, with my background, I think I have a pretty good idea of what your house is worth. Right. So I'm trying to be realistic versus, you know, we, we always want to, you know, sellers, we always want to get them the most because that's one of their main uh, goals. But our other goal is to also sell your house. Sell house. <laughs> so yeah. you have to be you have to meet somewhere in the middle there on that. That that certainly makes sense as as far as listings go because it's it'd be really easy to come in and give a very high price and and the house may never sell even though you, yeah and and then it affects the mentality of the seller because if you know their house is worth seven fifty but somebody came in and said I could get a million for it well um, the seller has already got that number in their head and so any offer under that um, is going to be. Uh, tough yeah. to, for them to swallow, tough pill for them to swallow. And that's, that's part of our presentation. And, right. and part of our business model is I will tell sellers that, and, and a lot of times they'll, you know, they may have interviewed other agents. I said, look, you want 850 and everybody's telling you 750. And I says, there's going to be an agent who walks in your door and it's going to tell you, I'm going to get you 850. Yeah. And, or I'll, you know, I'll list it for 850. Mm -hmm. Let's go for 850. Right. And I said, and it's, it's not going to help you they're, they're probably not going to sell it, but in the end, if they do sell it, 
you're probably going to, you know, especially in the, uh, like when we had the declining market last year, you're probably yeah. going to sell it for 725 and you're going to be bitter. You're going to be mad at the agent. You're going to be complaining about them to everybody and you're never going to use them again. And I said, and that's not our goal. Our goal is to become friends, do business together and you to enjoy it. And for us to continue to do business in the, in the future. So if you want to do that, I, I just tell them, go, go with one of those agents. And because our, our goal is to accomplish your goals, but also continue to work together. That's great. That's great. Um, in conjunction with that, you mentioned a declining market. I saw you post um, on some social media today. Um, and tell me, what do you think is, is going on with early, this early January market um, in the Phoenix yeah. area? So we, we always go to those events because that, that report is probably the best report of data that we've found in Arizona. And so the what they're showing Crawford report, Crawford report. Yes. Yeah. And so their numbers are showing that we're already kind of, um, it, you know, people, people always want to go up or down, right. They, right. but we're kind of like more leveling out. And, and so her, her overall um, stats were that we probably, you know, we, we won't know for sure until, because the data always lags a little bit, sure. but from what we've seen is we're probably through the worst of it. Um, in fact, she said, if, if rates were, you know, rates, interest rates on mortgages are the only thing holding us back. Right. If interest rates are, were to come down for some reason, she's like, we could recover everything we've even lost in like three or four months. So we have that much demand and we're seeing it. We, we see a lot of buyers are out there. It's just yeah. that the payments just, they can't make sense with the prices and the interest rates make the payments too high for them. So now we're going to see doom and gloom in the news because last January through May was zoom up. Yep. Right. Yep. And so when the news is going to probably do the, the media line of year over year, we're down year over year, we're down every month until May. But then after May, we started going down and then we're leveling off. So then after we get, you know, to the middle of the year, hopefully our numbers are even with last year and the storyline will change for, for people. So, so that's what people are going to see now. Now, the investor side is, is when everybody's waiting on the sidelines is to get ahead of, of it. Right. Sure. Yeah. So that's what we're seeing. A lot of the investors are like buying, buying, buying now, because even, even if you're buying a house, you know, uh, for your family, Sean, last year, you, you know, you're, you're like, uh, or two year and a half ago, you're like bidding and paying over list Crazy. price and paying over appraisal. Uh, to lock in that lower interest rate. But if you can buy your house you want now without having to bid, without having to compete, getting concessions, getting things fixed, and then rates do go down, then you just refinance and you're in the house you wanted and you lower yep. your payment. So makes sense. You know, that's, I think that's the story of 2023. Um, I think it's going to be a good year. Uh, you know, our second quarter is typically always good here. This year we have the Super Bowl, we have the the waste management Phoenix Open, we have I think the final fours here. So we have a lot of great things. And then um I think we'll that'll lead into a good third and fourth quarter for our, yeah. our real estate market. Big job support coming down the pipeline Oh yeah, too. absolutely that. I mean, we see people moving here, high paying jobs. Mm -hmm. So that's that all that drives the market. You know, we work we work at uh, some in Prescott, like Havasu and Yuma, of course. And and in those areas, you know, it's it's a little tougher because the jobs, you know, they don't have a lot of the high paying jobs. So the, right. the markets are pretty, uh, typically pretty stable, like in Yuma. Um, but, but here in Phoenix, where we're getting those increase, the influx of jobs, high paying jobs, that'll be really great help for us. Now, let me ask you, um, just a point of clarification. Um, you said that the market would recover in two to three months. Now, do you, are you, were you referring to the volume of sales or the price because both have declined um, right um and the volume of sales has declined rather significantly um more than the price has declined um so would that recovery be more people are buying again or the i mean i know they run kind of together but yeah not entirely well from the data they reported it would be a little bit of both but 
not only because like you said, the volume decline because we've lost a lot of sellers. Yeah. Because, you know, like, you know, a lot of sellers are in the same position. They got an interest rate around 3%. So even if they want to move, you know, do they want to move into a higher interest rate on their mortgage? No. Right. And, and, and so it doesn't make sense. So if, if uh, they're assuming if, if everything goes well and interest rates pop a little bit, that'll create sellers, you know, motivate sellers to sell. And then, so they go buy. So then that'll just increase. And then you have all these buyers waiting to buy. So with one, you know, transaction, you can affect, you know, three eventually. Yeah. Um, that'll be interesting to watch. I, I think you made a lot of great points on that. Um, yeah. I don't know if prices will, I, I mean, I can't foresee them going up like they did before. Sure. Um, kept, you know, with inflation and whatnot, but I think, I think pricing will steady, will level out and then, but we'll see that volume. And that's really in real estate. What we just need to see is volume, because if you have volume, it benefits all these ancillary uh, industries, you know, like home inspections, sure. title companies, um, home warranties, everything just thrives off of volume. Yeah. Appraiser um, back to that too. And, you know, they, they say the average person and I'll butcher the number a little bit, but with every transaction or every house purchase, they're spending somewhere in the range of $15,000, um, meaning that they have to make repairs or they're buying new couches or yeah. they're painting um, or replacing the appliances. And so, um, you know, the transaction of houses is is rather important for the good of, of the general global economy too. Yeah. Um, exactly. And, but in Arizona, I mean, it's one of our, our main drivers here, real estate. It is. Huge. One of the five C's. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, and, you know, and we've seen, um, we've been doing some consulting a little bit with other companies that are just building all these massive uh, condo or single family home rentals. Uh -huh. uh, and they've come in and because they're just building to rent and you, cause you'll see these big neighborhoods and you're like, Oh, well, let's see when they goes for sale. And it never does. It all of a sudden it goes for lease. Interesting. And so that's a whole new dynamic to our, our area. And, you know, I, and I'm sure, you know, they've already alluded, eventually they're going to be looking to sell those properties. They're just going with the market, but when the market changes and, you know, they're great for rentals right now, but eventually they're, they're going to look to put that supply into the, into the economy. So explain that concept. That's, that's relatively new to me. So they'll take a larger plot of land, subdivide it, build houses. And then instead of saying these are for sale they're saying these are for rent and maybe for sale one day yeah for now they're for rent and and they're like a, a long-term hold for them so there's looking there are um some kind of group of people investors looking for passive income uh -huh. and then because right now we know rents are hot right. so they're they're looking to do those rentals and then um their mindset is you know after rents decline or or the environment changes uh, their, they will, their exit strategy is to sell the whole asset, whether it be hmm. entirely or, um, individual, individually, uh, by PCI. Yeah. Interesting. So there's all, there's all kinds of different, uh, elements out there, you know, uh, we see, you know, just like all these hedge funds, just like everybody in corporate America is putting money into their 401k right? and, and their 401k, cause we know the stock market wasn't great last year. Right. So now they're, they're putting, the money into real estate because it's a better investment than, than stocks at the moment. Long, yeah. At the moment, more stable. Um, you mentioned too, you want to be their kind of lifetime advisor, um, your client's lifetime advise, advisor. Um, how do you continue to build those successful relationship once the, you know, the, the document is signed and they, they get the house. Um, how do you keep in touch with them for the next purchase and, and the following purchase after that? Yeah, it's it's so funny because uh, we were talking about that, where you have like a buyer and you're talking to them. Obviously, every week we give updates, but sometimes it's almost every day we're seeing them at the inspection, seeing them at seeing just uh, you know looking at homes and whatnot. And then you give them the keys, and and most of the time they never you know they don't need your services anymore. Right. So you never hear from them, and it's so weird because you have this relationship for maybe you know 30, 45, 60 days. And then it's just gone. So we try to we try to do um, client appreciation events. We do mm -hmm. um, 
you know, like movies. We've done a few, few uh, movie theater rentals and invite all our clients and or maybe little events. And we try to see everybody as, as well as we, we try to keep in touch and, and with people and go see them or just call them once in a while. But, but yeah, it's, it's like a, it's like all in and then, you know, then it's over sometimes. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's important, but they, you know, the, the sales one one is, is of course the fruit is in the follow-up. So it sounds like you're doing yeah. a great job keeping in touch with people for that next shift in their life. Yeah. We, and you know, that's why we have those conversations and, uh, you know, we've been asking everybody right now is like, what's your 2023 real estate goals? Uh, even if we haven't spoken to them in a little bit, because we want to see if, and a lot of times people tell us, you know what, I'm thinking about getting a rental this year. Well, you know, you that's good to know. So then, okay, what are you looking for? What price range, what kind of thing, or, or, you know what, I'm going to have my, um, my, my son or daughter's graduating college. And we're thinking about buying a townhouse where they're at. So, okay. So now it's good to know. So we can start thinking about that. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, especially when, when times are good, it's, it's really easy to forego um, yeah. all those hard phone calls and the the gr grunt work that it takes to, to kind of keep those relationships strong. But um, it's certainly probably the most important part of, of a relationship style business. Yeah. Um, well, it's like any business. It takes so much more money to get a new client sure. versus you know, cause you gotta, Oh, here, here's my Google page. Here's, you know, let me convince you that I'm a great real estate agent. And then, and then, you know, you've already taken them through the process and they know you're great. They'll, they'll refer you business. They'll use you again, but you know what, we, all we got to do is stay in front of them and, and stay in contact. Right. It can constantly. Yeah. I mean, it's the old, old adage, adage um, of a garage door person to put a sticker on the garage door because yeah. you don't need them until you need them. But the truth is, is you may or may not call that person. You're probably going to get the the most recent person that you had um, in touch uh, or in front of you so that you can, um, you feel comfortable with them. There's something yeah. psychologically about that. Yeah. Um, I've heard people tell me like, oh yeah, my real estate agent was great. You know, they use them a long time ago and I was yeah. like, all oh, right. You know, what's their um, name? <laughs> yeah. I've done that. And they're like, oh, I don't know. And honey, do we have that card? Is that card around? And, and it's funny because they're telling me about this whole story and they can't even remember their name. And I said, would you refer them or, you know, give them a, a referral? Well, yeah, I, I would. You know, this is a long time ago. I would ask these things and I was like, yeah, we never want to have that happen to us. <laughs> you don't. And I mean, I, I've, I've noticed the same thing too, where you have the um, Cardinal schedule with the magnet on there and it's sticking on the fridge. Yeah. And, and I looked at it and I look at the sign of the listing agent because I'm there for the inspection. I look at the sign of the listing agent and it's different than the sticker on the fridges. Yeah. <laughs> and I always thought that was kind of a funny you can't just send that. You have to also continue to reach out if you have that connection or reason to yeah. send that to them. I know. Um, Cause asked. you want to be, you want to be the person on the, with the sign on the front and not right. the sticker on the fridge. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sometimes it's just like, you know, I asked them like, Oh, I just grabbed that. Cause I wanted the schedule or, you know, things yeah. like that. Or it's like, Oh yeah. Why didn't we call, you know, they totally spaced it. <laughs> um, we have to ask a couple of questions as we're starting to wind down. And I'm, uh, um, one certainly want to be respectful of your time, but, um, as a real estate agent, as an agent that works with, um, first time home buyers, um, multi-purchase, um, clients, and then even investors, um, what do you like the most about home inspections? Uh, home inspections, I think is, you know, everybody dreads it, you know, at first, but I think the home inspections nice because everybody, uh, will feel better after it happens. Right. Yeah. Cause we're always scared of the boogeyman, but <laughs> nine out of 10 times it's not there. And so everybody's like, Oh, okay. You know, uh, they just feel better because they feel they know so much more about it. Uh, the awesome. Inspection. Awesome. And then, um, what do you like the least outside of us being the boogeyman <laughs> or delivering the news of the boogeyman? <laughs> Uh, the least of home inspections. Yeah. What do you like the least about a, the home inspection process? Um, you know, it, I think it, it's the, the answer would be is everybody's threshold is different. Yeah. Uh, you tell people they have termites, some freak out and other people are like, yeah, we know. So, cause we, you know, we have a lot of people relocating from like the Midwest or uh, Northwest yeah. and their termites are totally different than our termites. Yep. So, you know, people's thresholds on things, um, you, you know, you could have something where like a plumbing issue 
and and it could just be like a leak in a faucet and people are uh, some people are like oh my goodness i don't even know if i want to buy this house and other people it could be like hey your main line is falling apart and they're like all right well i guess we'll have to get that fixed you know yeah. so it's er everybody's um uh, everybody's threshold but you you don't really know until it happens so i guess that's the that's the, the scary part of the home inspection that's a hundred percent true i mean i've i've seen a near perfect house and the, the buyer came in and it was it, during the home inspection it was literally the longest they ever spent in the house. And we're going through the review and there were maybe like three issues with the house. It was brand new build, new construction. And I get a call from them next week with a different property address. And I went, why are they looking to buy another house? This thing was perfect. And after talking with them, they said, I just spent time in there and I realized that this wasn't home. Um, where, wow. so they canceled on a new perfect house and they ended up buying a house that actually had some issues. So their threshold was different, but it was just a really interesting kind of case study to see what you think is perfect when you're actually spending time there. It isn't necessarily perfect to them at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. The, the home inspection is a good point in the purchase timeline of where we're at, right. because a lot of people get caught up and they overthink the writing that even writing an offer. Right. I said, look, we're just seeing if we're even, we may not even don't, don't feel like this is the house because they may say no to your offer. Yep. So, and, you know, and, and then you get into the contract and then, but by the time you get to the hunt inspection and they've been in it a few times, then it's, then that's kind of like, we know, all right, we have, we're going to continue on with this process. It's a good point. Rick, um, I want to congratulate you on on a successful development of your business and an application of your pivots. Um, I think that's really outstanding. Um, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, um, how do they? All right, they can uh, they can look on uh, probably Instagram's a really good place. A lot of people, uh, Rick DeLuca Real Estate is yeah. there. Um, they're welcome to call 602-456-5050. Um, and you know, we're, we're all over the internet too, DeLuca real estate group, but, uh, yeah, we're here to help the buyers, sellers. And of course, all of our investors are, we're helping them build their portfolios every, every day. Love it. Rick, thank you so much for your time today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Yep. Thanks, Sean. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you for listening to Just Another Real Estate Podcast. For the latest episodes, please subscribe and be sure to follow Dwell Inspect Arizona on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. To contact Dwell Inspect Arizona, call us at 480-867-4599. If you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, email our team at office at dwellinspectaz.com.